So, just a very quick introduction. My name is Sachin Gupta. I work at Palladium, and uh, delighted to be asked by the Beam uh, organisers to to help out with this session. So, thanks very much for that. And uh, yeah, and it's a real honour being able to engage and have some discussions prior to this with with some uh, really exciting speakers with some really interesting stories to tell. Um, so, just as a bit of prelude, and we'll crack on. Is um, is uh, I, this apparently is a very heavily subscribed session, so it's fantastic to see so many people here. And um, uh, one of the things I'd love to find out a little bit more about, and then that'll help us structure the Q&A, is, um, is just to get your thoughts on actually what was of such great interest. Why did you pick this session out of the other ones that are available? Whether you have any expectations around what you want to get out of the session or any kind of issues you'd like to raise. Um, as one of us said, I'm sure there's a few frustrated speakers out there that are probably thinking, what about my story? I should be being heard here. So, so we'll try and kind of fit some of that in and, and you know, because I want to make sure this session is a bunch, as much about trying to capture um, some of the really rich experiences and insights that you've all got here, as well as listening to the three case studies that hopefully will provide some provocative thoughts and discussions and questions for us. So can I ask one thing? Could you... Um, just take one sheet of paper on each table and maybe just circulate it. And if anyone's got anything that they want to scribble on there, abusive or not, about you know, why they chose a the session, what's of interest to them, or what they want to get out of it. And maybe someone will just come around when you've finished and then feed them back to me. And I'd love to try and just kind of synthesize that and then kind of we'll use that to reflect on the Q&A session after the presentations. Um, is that OK? Um, so brilliant. So without much further ado, I'd like to ask David um, uh, and if you could introduce yourself as well but first and then, um, and then and crack on with our first uh, case study. So I will try and, and, and not uh, take too many circuitous journeys and try and stick to the point. So I'm David Elliott, I'm a director of the Springfield Centre. I'm presenting uh, uh, an experience on Emswari. Uh, it's not an experience that I've been implementing. I have my research hat on, uh, going to look at an experience that FSD Kenya uh, have been working with and I'm presenting that back to you today. Um, we talk about adaptive programming, so I'll, I'll, I, of course, we've already got fixed presentations, so I'll, ad I'll adapt in just three ways. Uh, Jim Tambon called for more, better, better examples, uh, which have some basis and foundation for them. Jim, I hope this is one. Uh, Patricia called for evidence. This is written up uh, by an independent author, me, so hopefully that might meet her needs. Um, and, uh, and Stuart made a point earlier, which I thought was valid, which is pilot to scale is not the same thing as scaling pilots. So in this presentation, I'm, I'm going to use this, this ridiculously termed AAER framework. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't sound particularly great, um, but I'm going to use that to give a framework for understanding pilot to scale and scale in terms of, of, of breadth of, uh, and depth. And I'll explain what those concepts mean. Uh, and I'll try and use a practical example of them, sure, to understand what piloting to scale means. And I will close with a quick look at some of the facilitation attributes. How did they deliver this? What were some of the success factors behind this, uh, this experience? So let me just introduce M. Shwari very briefly. It's, uh, it's a product. It's a partnership between CBA, Commercial Bank of Africa, and, and Safaricom, who are the, the owners of M-Pesa. Uh, it's a banking product. It offers savings and loans, short-term loans, and it's uh, piggybacked on the M-Pesa platform. It offers savings. Uh, it, the, the, the savings accounts are interest-bearing. Uh, it offers that. The short-term 30-day loans on a fixed-fee fixed fee basis. Uh, it was launched in 2013 when only 700,000 Kenyans had uh, access to, to formal banking access, according to the Finaccess survey. That's important because when we look at pilot to scale, within one week, more than a million people, had, most of subscribers, had asked for the SIM code to change from M-Pesa to m A million people by the end of the first week. By the end of the first quarter, 2.9 million people had opened accounts with Emshwari. 5 million by the end of the first year. 9.2 million people had accounts by the end of the second year. Pilot to scale. Um, the uh, project initially was saying, let's start with 100,000 over 12 months. Let's, let's, let's curb our ambition. Let's get it right. A million people in a week. 5 million people in a year. 9.2 million people after, after two years. Should we just stop there? Pilot to scale, there we go. Achieved, done. Uh, or let's have a look at some of these lessons and see what underpinned this and what this actually means in practice. So let's carry on with Emshwari. Of course, we're piloting to scale, and by scale, we're looking at particularly our target groups. Who is getting access to the things that we, uh, we think they need access to? Well, at the end of the first year, 19% of their clients were under the national poverty line as defined in Kenya. Uh, by the end of year two, that had increased to 30% 
of clients. That's getting close to 3 million people uh, that are under the poverty line. 57% uh, of clients who get access to savings accounts get access to credit facilities now. And the non-performing loan rate is now down to around about 2%. Uh, new competitors have emerged. There's competition in the marketplace now offering these things. Uh, there's new, uh, new products. There's innovation on this platform, which we'll look at, that have emerged here. And Emshwari is also now being expanded to a number of countries beyond Kenya. So from pilot to scale is the title of this session. Uh, is this scale, is this, is this change systemic? Uh, well, let's have a look at that. So let's have a look by introducing a quick framework. We have the AAR framework. Those of you, I'm not going to explain it in depth. It's in the operational guide, for those who don't know. Uh, but we're looking at getting sustainability first. We're looking at piloting something with somebody, and we're looking at whether that actually delivers a discernible benefit to our target group. And we're looking at to ensure that uh, the incentives are aligned that mean the supply and the transaction happens, supply and demand happens. It's good for all parties, and it will continue to happen as we go forward. So we're looking at that, and we're looking at that in the sort of piloting phase, trying something new with somebody and looking at the efficacy of that in different, uh, different aspects. We also then, if it's, some, if, if it's good and wholesome, et cetera, uh, we want to then, uh, one would expect it to get to, to scale. And scale, of course, is a, is, a, is a relative thing. It's a contextual thing. And we should be looking at what that scale means in advance and seeing whether or not we're achieving it. And we're looking at scale expand in terms of the, 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 the proportion of people that we think this uh, innovation is relevant to and how penetrative are we getting with that. And also the nature of the market system. How do we think? Is it, is it a market system with hundreds of competitors, five competitors, one big government? So we need to be looking at the nature of the market system and how what getting to scale means. And once it gets to scale and gets normalized in a market system, you would expect other things to happen. Once something is normalized, you'd expect that to create other opportunities or threats in other parts of the market system, not in the core. So you'd expect to see something, something here. And that's uh, uh, more what we do, the crowding in phase, but we have the, the scale in terms of expand, more people getting more things. And the result of that, when we get to a degree of normalization, you'd expect that in itself to lead to a range of other changes. So that's, in effect, the framework. Just walking through that with the experience, in the adopt phase, we want to test something. We want to test the ownership of the individual and the efficacy of this on the target group. So uh, some, some key things that might give us some sense of ownership, some sense of it, is relative investments. So CBA invested around about $14 million in this relative to 650000 overall by FSD Kenya. Just gives a slight sense of ownership. Uh, the return on this, um, the commercial return for CBA, they broke even in 11 months operationally. And within, uh, um, I think it was within seven, 17 months, they broke even from their initial investment as well. So um, it now contributes 19% of net profits of the CBA banking group. Um, and in terms of, uh, is it go good for them? Well, certainly. Is it good for our target group? 19% uh, of the poorest have access uh, in the first year, uh, and a million people or so uh, got access uh, uh, in the first week. Thinking then about the soft side, if you like, of some of the indicators of, of fostering ownership, how did that happen? Well, it was very much led by CBA and supported by, uh, nurtured by, nudged by, um, uh, by uh, FSDK staff and advisors who were embedded in the teams in a supporting role. And uh, 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 FSDK were an active investor, a social venture capitalist, if you like. There's lots of iterative points where they were jointly reviewing whether it was working for both parties. Um, there was a comment, I think, that um, the key guy at F uh, CBA said that um, if, uh, if we don't do what uh, FSDK want, they'll be, they'll be the first ones to tell us and the first ones to leave. Uh, so they, the, the clarity of mutual purpose was very strong here. Uh, the, the partnership was very strong and meaningful here. So we get into adopt. Lots of people get something which we think has a material benefit. CBA are benefiting from this themselves. Uh, strong sense of ownership and sustainability emerging here. But we want to test that a little bit more. Once we withdraw our teams and they have this product, do they continue to do something with it? Uh, do they adapt it in some way? Well, yes, they did. When they started, they had telecoms data, which they put predictive credit scorecards on. As soon as you start launching the product, you then have real clients coming in and allows you to transition that scorecard from anticipated to observed uh, outcomes. So that develops your scorecard as you go through. So they were doing that themselves, and that led to a significant reduction in default rate from anticipated to observed, and how do we strengthen and improve things. 
without any negative impact on client growth. Client growth continued, as I showed you earlier. They also looked at another aspect, that over time, the existing clients were, they may have borrowed once, but don't borrow again. And they may have had a facility offered to them, but they didn't take the loan. So they wanted them to look into their existing client base and seek to, to stimulate greater responses. Um, so they took a behavioral economics approach where FSDK did advise them on some of the methods they might use to do segmentation analysis. Uh, they started doing text messaging, different types of text messages to control groups and treatment groups, and looked at do messages have an impact on behavior? And if so, what kind of messages have an impact on behavior? I can't tell you what they are because they're commercially proprietary, um, um, but they're all within 140 characters uh, in a text message thing, so succinct speaking, uh, unlike me, I suspect. Um, so uh, they did stimulate responses, 95% higher response rates. Those practices are now embedded within the organization. They do this themselves on a regularized basis to try and stimulate uh, uh, behavior of existing clients. So in the, in, the sustain in the pilot phase, if you like, the pilot itself was at scale. The pilot got to scale in terms of the numbers of people. Um, but that's not scale that we're looking at in terms of systemic change. This is only one part of it. Sustainability is the platform upon which scale can be built. And sustainability of this one player with this one product was pretty strong at this stage for all the reasons I've just gone through. So let's have a look at Expand. In Expand here, I mentioned that uh, we wanted to look at the penetration of this product to the target group. Well, 60% of those that were applying were being rejected for loans. So the majority were being rejected for loans. And of course, we learned nothing about the rejected majority. And the rejected majority are discernibly poorer than those that are getting access. So FSDK went to them and said, look, can we work, surely some of the 60% uh, may be viable for you as clients going forward. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. Shall we look at that together? And the CBA said, uh, we're quite happy making the margins we're making. Um, well, not sure. But there was enough uh, sense of moral duty, having got into this process, to want to look at it. So they structured a deal using a credit guarantee scheme to go and start lending, segmenting and lending to these different 60%, uh, and seeing which of those 60%, if any, could be brought into the net. And uh, that led to about a million more people of discernibly poorer backgrounds. So what do I mean by that that's tangible? The average uh, monthly credit balances on their M-Pesa accounts for those that were getting already access was about $10 a month. The average balance uh, on M-Pesa accounts for this million and more people was about a dollar a month. That's the kind of difference that we're talking about. And those that you know Kenya would know that people with a dollar a month are pretty damn poor. Um, but it was more than that. In learning about the 60% uh, rejected majority, in learning about that, uh, not only did a million more people get access, the sc credit scorecard, if you like, was developed and improved based on learning about the poor. And that had material impacts on the overall product. From 42 to 57% of clients are now getting access to, to the loan facilities across the whole portfolio. Um, the default rate reduced by 50% from around about 45 to 2%. As a result of learning more about the unbanked, if you like, the overall product and efficacy of that improved considerably. So not only did CBA seek to penetrate downstream, others, of course, came in. They had a two-year um, exclusive agreement with Safaricom. On the day that that two years came up, uh, KCB launched their new partnership with Safaricom and their new product, uh, KCB M-Pesa. That was launched last year. They, too, generated 1.4 million users in the first six months. Is that at the expense of CBA, or is it growing the market? I suspect it's somewhere in between. On the day, about in, in July, after this March, I was sat with a CBA uh, representative who, on his mobile phone, told me the day before how many new clients signed up to uh, Mshwari and how many loans were dispersed. And on that single day, in July, three or four months after competition emerged, 9,000 clients that day, new clients signed up, and 67,000 loans were dispersed. So there's no doubt there's some duplication, but I, I suspect strongly there's also further growth and development of the overall market. Others are also primed. Of course, Safaricom will be launching, I'm sure, others. Whether other competitors to Safari, Safaricom can emerge, I don't know yet, such as their market dominance, uh, but others are primed to enter this market and offer new things. The other aspect of Expand is that they're taking that product to other countries that are within the FSD 
Africa network. So FSD Kenya is bounded by, the, the, by Kenya, um, but it's going to, to uh, Rwanda, Uganda. It's in Tanzania already, and they're already doing that. So for FSD Africa is the apex organization, the learning of what's gone in Kenya and feeding that into their other trust organizations in other countries uh, is, is helpful. But that's not enough. That's expanding the core. That's more people getting access from more providers to the same thing broadly. Um, but it's got to such a scale already that you could argue it's normalized. So if it's normalized, what else is going on? Well, here's just a couple of things that are going on. Uh, MMI Holdings of South Africa, an insurance company, uh, has now put a, a, uh, a product onto Mshwari for Mshwari users called Hello Doctor or Semadoc, I think because it's, it's branded in, in, in Kenya. Um, and this is a medical subscription service offering a range of services for a, pre, for a subscription rate. Um, things like uh, phone diagnostics, like we have in the UK with NHS Direct. Uh, you can phone and speak to a doctor who will go through heuristics and try and diagnose the problem that you have. Uh, if a prescription is warranted, you can get prescription through SMS. And um, if you are um, admitted uh, as an inpatient to a hospital, you get a certain cash, uh, cash amount for that. And they're targeting specifically smaller towns. Smaller towns because uh, Nairobi is pretty well connected and served, but smaller towns are not. So it's explicitly targeting that, and their target is around 200,000 clients in the first year. They launched it in September. Um, I don't know exactly what the numbers are now, but I'm told they're very happy uh, that, uh, uh, with what's going on. So uh, I don't know the numbers yet. But that's a, a significant new departure, a significant new service that piggybacks on Mshwari. The other thing they're looking at is to promote term savings, uh, lock savings, leave savings on account, and on higher rates of interest. And this is a precursor to starting to get people to save towards more productive investments. The loans now are 30-day loans. The primary use is meeting basic consumption needs, paying school fees, uh, someone gets sick, meeting immediate health needs. Um, so it's tackling their uh, consumption needs and consumption poverty, but we're looking at products now, they're looking at products now, that can encourage term saving and build uh, an asset base, if you like, to invest in more productive activities. This is happening now. And other things are happening as well. So systemic change, uh, is it, is it, is it uh, sustainable? Well, yeah, I think they adopt and adapt the partners there. We've got innovation that works and somebody that's continuing to do it. Has it gone in terms of penetrating our target group and are there others crowding in and competition emerging and hopefully some innovation for that competition? Yes. That small thing of impact, what does it all mean? What does it all matter? A few questions start arising. Financial programs are defined by access. Access to finance is the policy objective of many of these programs. That assumes that access is a good thing. Um, well, so let's have a look at who's getting it. 10 million clients, 30% 30, 30 below the poverty line and increasing. The rejection rate of 53% is still high. It will continue to be, it's a program, I think, the product that's been adopted more quickly by the less poor. But you're seeing now, uh, as more people join, more people like to join from lower income groups, and it will go up to a certain level. I doubt it will go as high as M-Pesa because of the nature of the service, but it will continue to get more, more pro pores. You go up to a certain level. The benefits, uh, so what? We have access, but do we have usage? And does that usage lead to a benefit? And this isn't unique to, I'm sorry, this is unique to many aspects of financial services programs in uh, globally. Um, does access lead to benefit? And if so, what and how? And so uh, there is evidence that FSDK have got, empirical evidence, on uh, M-Pesa, uh, looking at the consumption impacts of M-Pesa and how consumption smoothing is far stronger for those that had access to it compared to those that don't, uh, which allows people to, to uh, smooth their consumption, which means they don't drop in and out of poverty all the time. They can continue to, to go on a more equal pathway. Uh, Mshwari builds on that and follows that and the primary use of it is still meeting basic consumption needs. So it's plausible at this stage that some of the impacts will follow those that are uh, of M-Pesa, uh, but at the moment it's anecdotal. There isn't any um, uh, evidence of the benefit that people get from access to 30-day short-term loans. Um, all the access to uh, able to build their savings and, and what might they do with them later. Um, so on benefits, it's a bit questionable. Uh, how do they bring it about? Sure, how do they bring it about? Well, diagnostics were key. Uh, understanding the poor and their money. Um, they gave, uh, there was a lunch, a dinner, they gave the product developer of the bank a copy of the portfolios of the poor, 
I said, you need to know about these people, read it, and if you're interested, talk to me later. He read it and said, Christ, I don't know anything about these people, uh, but maybe you do. Can we partner with you to learn a bit more about them? So this was a first principles approach to product development, responding to the financial diaries, uh, the portfolios of the poor uh, book. Um, vision, mutuality of purpose, vision at the partnership level about what we will do and what you will do. Um, the partnership itself, uh, clarity of roles of, of, of what we bring, what you bring, and how we structure that in certain ways. The modalities, yes, there's a legal framework, there's non-disclosure agreements. That, that was all peripheral, really. It was about the partnership that was driving the, the, uh, the effectiveness of, of the way in which they worked. Instruments changed as they went through uh, from, from market research, but of different types at different levels into financial guarantee instruments. Uh, so a range of different instruments applied at different times to meet different needs. Uh, the measurement process was pretty strong. Uh, who is and who isn't getting this in terms of access? Who is and who isn't getting it? And let's do something about it. And in learning more about it, we feed that back into improving and strengthening the product overall. This case is one of a series of cases that are about to be published. Um, one looking into FSD Kenya over 10 years as a market facilitator. What have we learned? What have they learned? And then a series of inter intervention level cases like Mshwari, um, but in savings groups, in SACOs, in SME finance, in microinsurance and in, in information products. So there's a range of things going on here. If you're interested to know more about those, uh, speak to me, or more appropriately speak to Joe Huxley, who's from FSD Africa, who's running this overall program, and we'll be doing something with these cases over the next six months. I'm sure that wasn't 15 minutes, but it was as fast as I could go. So thank you all for listening. Thank you. Uh, I, I may have missed it, because uh, you talked very fast. Um, but in the expand phase, did FSD play any role in working with the competition to bring them on board, or was the relationship with the original um, bank, um, would, would that have been seen as a betrayal maybe, uh, that, that you're going with the, the competition? Well, there are two things. Sorry, just to keep our recorders happy. Um, there's, there's two things. The nature of the market was such that Safaricom had a, a sort of monopoly access uh, to this market. They gave a two-year um, uh, exclusive agreement to, uh, to CBA. So FSD was saying, it's already failed at once. They had a previous to this, uh, Safaricom worked with Equity Bank to launch MK Show, and it failed. So for FSDK's point, FSDK's point of view, it was saying, let's work with CBA in a partnership to make this thing work, because we think it's, it's viable and it's valid. And we've learned, so their first empathy was to learn from the failure of MK Show, what went wrong. They also recognize that if we get it right with CBA, Safaricom being Safaricom, uh, very commercially minded, would launch uh, new agency agreements with new market entrants. So um, they felt they didn't have to do anything to stimulate that. Safaricom would just open up to others uh, as they went through. That's the main headline. They didn't need to do anything else, and it happened as, as planned, as anticipated. Where there was a discussion was around the real innovation. The real innovation was in the credit scorecard in taking telco data and projecting that onto financial services behavior. Um, and that was the intellectual property, really, that FSDK uh, were, were helping uh, CBA to build. That was a key part of it. And uh, that was covered by a non-disclosure agreement. So FSDK could not and would not work with suppliers to, to replicate that. Um, they couldn't talk about that openly. Um, shows that they didn't need to, actually, uh, because others were pretty able of doing their own thing. So. It could have been an issue in another case, certainly could have been. And they, they say that they could work with others, and they say to me they could, but they didn't. Um, but arguably, they didn't have to. So it's kind of a circular argument. We could have done, but you didn't. No, but we could have done. We didn't need to. It's happened anyway. In other examples, in other cases, yeah, they have worked with competitors. They have done other things. They have stimulated, expand directly. You probably know that CBA is owned by the president of Kenya, as is Brookside uh, Milk Industry, owned by the president of Kenya. Both companies have had spectacular growth and are great examples of scale. I wonder whether there's another dynamic that you're not addressing here. I don't know what you could possibly mean, Stuart. I almost think that the, we might need to start talking a little bit about some of the context around these things wherein scaling happens. And I think it's something to do with an enablement. And I don't mean my question to be cynical. Uh, it's just I think there is 
another element behind this, which is beyond Mshweri and the product, which is about political enablement? I'll answer two ways. I, I, I think this is a technical response to a uh, understand uh, to a demand side uh, analysis, if you like. I think it's genuinely that. There's been no. Um, uh, that I can see any, any sort of political interference in anything like this. Where I would see there's an issue is the market dominance of Safaricom, uh, where, was it, 35% of that is owned by the government of Kenya still. And that is becoming a problem. That is something which FSDK, uh, it's not covered by these cases, it's touched on a little bit in the, in the headline case. FSDK were instrumental in getting M-Pesa established in the first place, through getting regulatory approval uh, to allow agents to, to be part of the, uh, the banking network. And they've continued to, to see it get to scale. Once they saw it getting to that degree of market dominance, all their efforts have been on trying to curb that monopoly behavior of Safaricom and trying to get others, others involved in this. And that's been held up in the courts for some time. It will go through, I'm sure, fairly shortly. Um, but actually, it'll probably all be washed away through this new technology that's coming in called the switch, which will allow interbank trading, etc., which will increasingly make M-Pesa marginal because uh, it's far cheaper than the transaction cost of M-Pesa. So I don't think there's government issues in this case, but I think you could look at, uh, at government issues in the broader structure of the telecom sector, possibly. Um, but that's beyond my understanding and remit, obviously. Hi, James. Procedural origin of this project, in other words, whether they're done involved, who had to approve, who had to research, who had to make the pre-investment analysis always. I can see you, you are, you are, you are, you know, you are five things, and I forget the names, but the first two are important. So how did this project get off the ground? Sure. Um, the the, the um, FSD Kenya have been working as FSD Kenya formally since 2005, but David Ferrand and some of his other colleagues who were part of it have been working there since the 90s. They've just called something else then. So they had a lot of um, uh, reputation, a lot of understanding, a lot of connections in the financial services sector. Um, they had, pre precursor to this, there were two attempts to get a kind of mobile banking, digital banking platform that FSDK were involved with. Um, Mkesho, it wasn't involved with directly, but it did go in and do a learning from failure study and say, why did they fail? Um, they also tried it themselves with a different partner, and that failed as well. It didn't get commercial backing. So they had a lot of ideas and understanding about this, and, and they explicitly researched why it failed. What they were then looking for was a, a uh, conversation with somebody who was interested to know about this. And, uh, and this is where, up close and personal, I think that um, Stuart, you're in, came through in your presentation, you, you make your own luck. And uh, David had a dinner party with Mike Bristow, who was on the board of CBA, and, uh, and CBA with Mike Bristow was saying, look, we have this uh, two-year agreement, if you like. We have an opportunity with Safaricom to do this, but we're a commercial bank. We're not a retail bank. So we've talked about it internally. We probably want to do something with it, but we don't really know what to do. And the product developer was also at this dinner. And, um, and as I mentioned briefly earlier, um, he said, we don't, know about the, we don't know about the poor. We're not a retail bank. We've no idea. So that's when David put out of his bag the financial diaries of the poor and said, we'll start by reading that, Eric. Eric read that and came back and, and said two things. One, I now know what I don't know, and it's, it's everything. And two, I think you as FSD Kenya might know something about this. So can we work with you to help us understand the target group for which we're developing a product? So I use that term first principles approach. So a lot of the investment that uh, CBA made was in understanding that, that demand side, understanding that target market, and developing the kind of systems and branding and marketing and service support that would be needed to make that product work. FSDK's role at that stage was making its research available to it more broadly and was advising on, on research methods and, uh, and things that uh, CBA might use to understand its target market better. Once they'd done all that and they were ready to launch, it then changed into um, uh, embedding staff to help uh, build the credit scorecard on telco data, which hadn't been done globally before. So this was sourcing an international expert who they felt could do this kind of thing. Um, at, at that time. So that's where their kind of support went in at that stage, and then the support changed uh, over time to the segmentation analysis and then uh, um, impact assessment stuff. But that's how it started, James.
So, and obviously, I mean, Joe's in the audience and David, so if there are any very specific questions, then obviously there's lots of opportunities to follow up directly with them. Um, but just, Collins, could you introduce yourself and another fascinating case study, and then, um, yeah. All right. Uh, what I'm going to share with you here is basically our experience in trying to move a pilot through different stages to scale. I think the word scale is sometimes quite misleading because there are several definitions that uh, people talk about when they talk to scale. But I think I'll use that uh, AAR thing to say that we have moved it from the left side and we are moving it into the right side and that is to us the movement towards scale. So allow me then to share with you a brief history of the progr program that I'm going to talk about and then go into what have we learned and how have we pushed the buttons to move to the next stage. So, for PropCom, we got involved because there was a massive shortfall in supply of tractor services to smallholder farmers in northern Nigeria. Those statistics say a lot, but we struggle to find an entry point because the market involved several players that needed to be engaged. But we focused on the core market to be the relationship between a tractor service provider and a smallholder farmer. So that was our core market. And when we looked at that core market, it was very difficult to find what we could do. Even if you gave farmers a tractor each, well, would that enable them to get services? Maybe they could not afford the tractors in the first case. So we decided to look at the broader market and look at areas where we could intervene. So up to 2011, there was a first pilot with one bank known as First Bank. In that pilot, PropCom provided a cash-backed guarantee that was given to the bank. One vendor, Springfield Agro, got involved and gave tractor financing or got tractor financing from First Bank and they given they gave the tractor loans or the tractors to an association of tractor owners. There was an attempt to secure government-backed loan guarantee scheme known as NIRSAL. NIRSAL simply means Nigerian incentive-based risk sharing for agricultural loans or lending. So NIRSAL, we tried to get NIRSAL to get involved. They got involved initially, but somewhere in the middle they decided that the level of guarantee was too high and they would not want to participate anymore. They changed their level of guarantee and because of that, the whole thing collapsed. Everything died. So pilot number one, dead. We tried to revive it. We tried to talk to First Bank to go on they didn't want to get involved at all anymore. So come 2014, we had tried the whole of 2012, 2013, no movement occurred. So in 2014, we said we were going to try with another bank. So we picked a bank known as FCMB. We also approached several other banks to get involved. They were reluctant. They said, show us the money first and then we will get involved. But FCMB said they would get involved. We decided to do a number of things to make it easier for the bank to get involved. First, we worked with the Association of Tractor Owners to create what is called a buffer account. A buffer account was a three month payment for the tractor loans in advance. The reason for that was such that if any of the people who got the tractors failed to pay, we would fall back onto the buffer account. We then 
worked on a process that would enable the Tractor Owners Association to repossess the tractors from those who got the tractor uh, loans. We then worked with the vendor and designed a loan guarantee that was called buyback guarantee. The buyback guarantee simply meant that if there is a default and the tractor is recovered, then if it was sold in the market, then the difference between the amount of loan remaining and the value that it fetches in the market, that difference we covered 40% of it with our cash backed guarantee. We also started to do a bit of crowding in, but you can't crowd in people before they start seeing money. We did other complementary interventions. For instance, the owners of tractors were saying that when tractors are out in the field, they would not know where it is, what it is doing, and they only get so much every time. To do that, we had to go totally out of the core market and looked for a GPS, tra uh, GPS tracking system that could be installed on the tractor to enable the tractor owner to know how the tractor is being used. The paper guarantee, I've talked about it up there. We had to do capacity building of the association because they were the ones going to ensure that this whole thing worked. Then finally, we went back to Nirsal and help them to redesign their guarantee scheme. So, sorry. So what did we get? In 2011, there were 50 tractors. Everything was fine, but that stalled. And it stalled because of the Nirsal guarantee. In 2014, we only managed to get 27 tractors out. Repayment, 100%. Nirsal decided that they were going to come back in. We started getting interest from corporate tractor service providers. These are companies that buy loads of tractors and then they roll them out into the field. The pilot turned out successful. Moving forward, we have managed to get 27 tractors out there. Repayment still remains 100%. Nirsal has now taken over the guarantee, including the one that was given by Propcom, the buyback guarantee. Nirsal took over from us and we stepped out of the, the party. We now have two corporate tractor service providers working we have expanded the scheme to include what are known as tillers. Tillers are hand-held tractors, very suitable for women. We are now set for the current agricultural season. We are set to get 70 more tractors with about 50 more to be added towards the end of the season because the start with the new partners was a little late. So we expect this to be by the end of the year. Now, if you go back to what David said earlier on, what we were watching all the time is that repayment. If you can see repayment is 100% throughout. That to us was critical because if the tractor owners were able to repay their loan, then it means they are offering services out there and they are making money enough to repay. That then means that all the way up the chain to the bank that offered the loan in the first place, they are happy. And that was what we kept watching in all the three cases. With that working, then we had proved the concept. So, Anything else that we did was now to make people realize that there is profitability involved in doing tractor services. And that is why 
these corporate people have joined in, and that is why we are getting more interest with more members joining the association of tractor owners. Now, somebody will say 67 tractors, 70 tractors, compared to David's 1 million, 1.4 million, what is the scale here? But it would interest you that at that point, the number of smallholder farmers that were accessing tractor services were not more than 10,000. During this second pilot, we only managed to get to 13,000. But at this point now, we are over 60,000 farmers accessing what? Services. Now, if you compare that to the population of Nigeria and the population of smallholder farmers, again, we are just scratching on the what? On the surface. So the truth of the matter is, for us, what we are focusing on is not this thing going boom. We are focused on proving the business model. Because if the business model works, then the adoption, adoption, and uh, whatever in the marketplace will happen on its own, even when we are totally out of space. I want to mention at this point that we are actually, as PropCom, not investing any more money in this model. We are only investing the monitoring bits of it. Other results. FCMB initially had $1.3 million in money available for this type of loans. They have moved it to $4 million as at last week, meaning that they have seen there is money. We have now let out 107 tailors, and we are about to release another 250 tailors using the same model. Government has appointed one of the associations we have worked with and given them 500 tractors to manage because the government of Nigeria has been doing tractor service before and it didn't achieve any level of success. African Development Bank recently invited a team from PropCom to help them design a mechanization strategy for Africa. And the bulk of it is based on our experience of working with service providers to offer tractor services. Government of Nigeria is currently seeking to adopt the model. And the private sector who are involved have invested up to 3.4 million. When I say that, I'm excluding the amount that has been invested by, by FCMB. Very quickly, what has taken us through is to try and use aid more uh, differently. What do I mean? We had to adapt relatively quickly because of the NIRSAL policy change. If we didn't adapt and continued begging NIRSAL to do something, maybe we would not have moved at all. Failure by First Bank to scale despite successful repayment was basically because they depended heavily on that NIRSAL policy. Also, the Tractor Owners Association were given a grant as an incentive for having successfully repaid all the loan that they were given first. But that grant, how they divided it, actually caused a problem within the association where people started fighting over the grant. And the association had to split into, into two. So that then informed us that how you utilize aid money can either make or break an intervention. Also, investing in TA and writing major risks earlier on in the program is key to getting the pilot to be ready for, for scale. Again, still using aid differently, we repriced the risk. The real risk were at three levels. The first one was The, what we call the vendor had to be sure that he'll get repaid because he was operating in an area that he has never operated before. The second risk was how does the tractor owner ensure that he's getting back all his, 
is money from the services. So we looked at that and by putting in the buyback guarantee, we actually changed the whole model. Then secondly, we also demonstrated that there is actually no loss. The perceived risk in the intervention was not actually a risk because there is a 100% repayment. So, co-investing necessary to subsidize some business model discovery. Results must show that the risk ex exposure is very low and then we needed to actively monitor but most of all, we communicated these results to all the parties involved consistently and demonstrating that there is money to be made. S yes, again using A differently, we used multiple entry points. We were working with Central Bank on Nirsal, we were working with tractor owners, we were working with tractor market players, we were working with vendors and with commercial banks. All this work were going on concurrently to ensure that this whole thing worked. I think the real experience we got from there is use different but appropriate instrument at different points. Design clear exit for working with people, for instance, with vendors who said if you are performing well in terms of delivery and after sales service, then we will increase the what? the amount of guarantee. That made any guarantee we gave based on business performance. So if you tie incentives to business performance, you get some results. Grants should be given based on performance, I've just said that. To scale, build on existing structures. We realized very quickly that if you go with something extremely new, you'll take more time trying to get it adopted. So, one partner I remember telling me that if you think this is so profitable, why haven't you put your own tractor in the field? And that gave me a wake-up call. We always go out and tell people how innovative, yet we can't invest our own money into what we are calling innovative. When they told me that, I learned that really the innovative idea could be innovative, but if you are not ready to put your money, then listen to the person who is putting his money in there. They have an idea of what they want to invest in. Your partner will see the business sense if it is a good idea, so don't push it. Listen, learn, and nudge them along. Sorry, that was supposed to be existing models of businesses can be tweaked to actually deliver the scale that we are looking for. To scale again, actively co-create with partners. In most of the time between the second pilot and now, we keep talking to partners and working on what can work for everyone. So we keep co-creating. So crowding in does not mean investing more or rolling out. To us, crowding in means somebody voluntarily investing because they see money in the space. Look for linkages within the broader marketplace, even outside the market that you are dealing with. It is the recognition that you are working in an ecosystem. Solutions may be very far away from where you are focusing, but keep an eye on the big picture. Spend more time with and listening to the real actors in the sector. So rather than overanalyzing, be part of it, work with them. Too much research only tells you what you already know, interestingly. So about upfront analysis, what we are saying, action research and learning by doing helped us to go the route we are. Small bets versus big bets, well, it is situational, very contextual. Big bets have higher risk and uh, sometimes when you go for big bets, consider the capacity of your partner. Many of the interventions we do fail because there is no sufficient internal capacity of our partners. So. It's not about you, 
Let momentum build, help steer the momentum is our approach to this. Then, when to scale, again, depends very much on your definition of scale. But market scale when participants see opportunity for benefits. That's our belief. And therefore, what we say is scale when the model makes perfect sense for the final consumer of the product that you are talking about. I think I leave it at that by saying that let's define scale appropriately for every intervention. It is not about big numbers. It's not about anything. It could be about getting an organic growth over time to, s to serve more people in the future. Enrich your inquiry, uh, inquiry language. What do I mean here? Many times people tell us that ask why all the time. I think why has its lim limit. Really the thing that drives moving to the next step is asking what if. And when you ask what if, you'll find that you who is asking the what if must give whatever it is if. Many of us tend to ask, but we don't give suggestions that then stimulate what? Debate. I think that is how we have done it. Use aid money to stimulate and reward business performance. I think to us, this is one experience we have gained. If you just give grants for the sake of it, then it tends to stall. But if you reward performance of business, then you move to the next level. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Collins. So um, just another plea. I had some really interesting uh, contributions from people about kind of issues or questions that they might want to raise in a general discussion later. So if the first two presentations have made you think about anything that you want to throw in as a comment or for or questions for the panel or for the kind of the sector to discuss more broadly, then please reach out and grab a piece of paper. Um, I think I'm a bit hot, so I'm going to try and fiddle about with this control panel. And if the lights go off, then, then you'll know why. Um, but any, uh, 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 can we take a couple of questions? If anyone's got any questions specifically on the tractor story? And James, um, let me, oh, we've got two mics. <laughs> Here we go. Thanks, Collins, for the case. Um, it seems to me that the association that you, you talked about of tractor owners was pretty critical in enabling the bank to feel comfortable that, 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 that they could recover the tractors in the event that someone wasn't repaying. And, th and th that seems to be the innovation between failure in the previous example and the success of the next one. So, I mean, can you talk a bit more about that association? How strong was it? How capable was it? Who created that association? How did you enforce all tractor operators to be part of that association? And, and did you have to actually have any recourse to use the association's skills and, and capabilities to get tractors back and to recover them at any point? Thank you. Can I go for it? All right. I, I have to admit that the 2011 period, I was not yet with the PropCom, so I can only rely on what I've read and heard. But the association had actually been existing in some way, and PropCom simply supported some capacity building. I don't think there is anywhere where I have read where the association was created by PropCom. So. But in both the, in the first pilot and second pilot, the association was critical because they were the ones to put pressure on those who got the tractor loans to actually repay. And I think that was one capacity that was constantly built on how can they follow up on loans, how can they encourage their members to pay. In the second pilot, the buffer account was critical because without that buffer account, the association would not be able to remain current in case there was any default. But up to today, that buffer account has not been touched. It is intact. And members of the association are saying in the next phase, they want to even put more buffer account just because agricultural season is what? Cyclical. That had not been considered because sometimes the tractor might be sitting out there for several months. But it is the association that manages the buffer account and that 
has been one area where we have kept building the capacity of the association. So, in responding very quickly, I think the association has been critical and building its capacity is critical to the whole model. Another thing that we are currently struggling with and it is now a, an issue on the demand side for tractor services. How do you deploy the tractors in a way that is more efficient? How do you know where you send a tractor to and it will do 10 farms rather than going 70 kilometers to do one what? One farm. That is part of the work we are now doing with the association to find a way for aggregating that demand to make them deploy the tractors more efficiently. Right. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, we are in a similar uh, situation here in Zambia with Msika. We started the same uh, type of arrangement in trying to mechanize agriculture. And we have moved from about from eight tractors in 2011 up to about 375 tractors as, as at now. And the payment rate has been going at 100%, like we have uh, said. And because of that, we have seen more vendors and more demand of, uh, of the tractor. Until last year, uh, when the, our economy, uh, the, the dollar exchange uh, rate uh, went uh, haywire, and the, it has put much pressure on the repayment of the farmers and we foresee that a certain number of farmers who are struggling now uh, to meet uh, the demand because of the uh, the change of the uh, of the economy could be uh, i was wondering if they could be you could have maybe uh, experienced such uh, and, and how how you dealt with the, uh, the issues of the exchange rate and the interest rate becoming increasing and the if there are any experiences to, uh, to share so that we can also learn, because I foresee a situation where a number of farmers will struggle to pay back, not because they are the one to default, but because of the economical right. uh, happening within the, uh, our country. Okay, uh, I think uh, Nigeria is going through almost a similar phase where exchange uh, or uh, foreign exchange is very hard to come by. Importers are struggling to bring in uh, tractors and so on. Within this intervention, what we have said is that as the cost of tractors increase, we need to enrich the number of services that a tractor can offer. So we are working with the association to look at do you need to use the tractor only for one purpose of plowing or can you deploy it in an, a number of ways? That then enables the tractor owner to repay back the loan based on what he uses the tractor for. So we are keen to make sure that the repayment continues because if the repayment falls, I think that will kill the whole model. So we are looking at how do we enrich the other services. but with increasing interest rate, I think one of the reasons why we are having trouble getting more tractors on is because in Nigeria there was sort of people could not s spend money outside the country because of the exchange situation. So some tractors that were supposed to be brought in, some uh, tillers that were supposed to be brought in have been cut off. We expect it to be worse unless things improve. In which case, we will simply work with tractor owners and the association to make sure that what they have is repaid for with the hope that the economy will kick up again. It is a problem, we are seeing it, and we hope that we can deal with it. For instance, the interest rates were 22% for last year. The bank was talking of taking it to 24%, but we said keep it at 23 because we have proved that repayment is 100%. So don't kick the interest. All right. So, so can we, yeah. 
brilliant. Thank you. So thank you very much, Collins. Yeah, and um, just while Andrew's setting up, um, I mean, it makes me reflect, and um, I don't know whether you have thoughts on it which we can pick up on, but uh, something common between the two presentations is um, makes me reflect. Um, everyone talks about failure and embracing failure, but actually a common trend emerging between the two case studies that you've both emphasised is actually that when you're talking about new product innovations that you want to go to scale, sometimes you don't, you can't afford for them to fail. I mean, the, the uh, David mentioned that actually part of the investment was that there had been a failed attempt at that product three years previously, and that would kill the market. It reminds me of um, something. Uh, one of our partners is uh, on a project as a human-centered design firm. That, and they they take credit for essentially um, developing the Bluetooth speaker, which is now you know everywhere ubiquitous. But kind of they developed the first one and so on. And something he said to me is, when you're designing a new product, actually you have a a responsibility to future developers because if you're launching a new product category and it fails, then the whole market will just forget about it. Investors forget about it for five or six years until everyone kind of actually forgets. So, in a way, interesting that Collins mentioned that the buffer account was was critical because, as I remember, recall it, you know, that the fact is you didn't what you couldn't afford for those to f to fail because you need because you're essentially innovating around a new product category that that you you need the demonstration effect to work. Anyway, so Andrew, thank you. I'm uh, Andrew Wilson from Helvetas, as it says up there. I uh, am the project manager of a youth employment project. Uh, it's a little bit different context. Uh, we're looking at jobs and we're operating in the Western Balkans, and particularly Bosnia-Herzegovina, a rather small country in comparison to Kenya, Nigeria. Uh, so what I'll talk about today is a little different in that sense. Uh, in how do we define scale, for one thing. Uh, it's also going to be a bit of a riff on the AAER framework that David introduced, and particularly about uh, looking towards alternative paths to scale. Uh, and I'm going to be a little bit provocative uh, when I say, why pilot, and perhaps we can skip a pilot. And when I am talking about a pilot there, what I'm really in being provocative, trying doing is talking about the traditional kind of taking a business model and having someone reproduce it. So focusing really on the E in AAER. And in our case, uh, what I'll be arguing is that the R was the key for various reasons. So why do we pilot? Well, I mean, sustainable change at scale is tough to do. It's not just something that uh, falls out of the sky into your lap most cases. Uh, we sometimes need to do it to learn something, to prove a concept, mitigate risk. Uh, in our case, it was more about uh, initiating a process. Uh, that would be the closest thing for us. Uh, but because it costs money to pilot, it may add steps if you pilot something in a case where you can go fairly large scale right away. It may fail, and most important again for us, the last one, may not fit the structure of a sector to do this traditional type of pilot. And we'll get more into that a little later on. So we'll look at an intervention that, to quote, uh, skipped the pilot, went directly to scale without trying to see that business model reproduced. Uh, defining scale for us, uh, like Collins has said, uh, relative to the size of the country, and the fact that we're looking at jobs. Uh, someone getting a job is quite transformational to them. Uh, but creating a job isn't so easy, particularly in an upper middle income a country in uh, Europe, which as many of you know, is not exactly the engine of growth that it once was. When we started looking at the IT sector, what we uh, did is the typical uh, review, the analysis, et cetera, the diagnosis. And uh, this was around mid-2013. We were doing what we knew as uh, market systems work at the time. Uh, and we looked at constraints. Uh, and in the IT sector, the key things that we kept finding were lack of public-private dialogue was an issue. Weak support for international marketing because Bosnia is not a big market for IT services. It's really about outsourcing. People are selling into Western Europe, the US, etc. There's little information about IT sector opportunities that both meant as uh, young people entering 
as employees, also starting up businesses and growing. People just weren't aware of it. Uh, and that in extended into government, where we had somebody tell us, yes, we have e-government in Bosnia. Everybody in my department has email. So the awareness level was super low. And actually, the industry liked it like that because they were left alone at the time. It's also a strong preference for public sector jobs. So actually, parents would even stop their kids from going into the private sector and IT because, you know, my kid should be a lawyer. My kid should be an economist. But when we were looking at all of these things and what it would take to change them, we found kind of a keystone problem. So as we were going through our interconnected market systems, we kept arriving at fragmentation and detrust between firms. So that kind of linked the key constraints that we had and gave us the most obvious entry point. And we entered it in a couple of places and dealt with it. Uh, I'm talking about this technology hub today, but we also worked on it in different ways as well. As we were doing this, an opportunity came up. And this is this Bosnian-American IT entrepreneur. His name's Edin Saracevic. He had sold his company in Washington, DC to uh, I guess uh, Na Navionics originally was bought by Nokia, so there was some money behind it to uh, try some new things. He, could, he was financially able to have an idea. Uh, and his idea was the hub would house IT companies from all over the uh, Sarajevo region under one roof, but it wouldn't just be about that. Uh, it would include an IT academy, so something working on skills, uh, an incubator and co-working space so that freelancers and startups could be in the same place as the big boys, that there would be all kinds of informal exchange between those different types of companies, etc. And essentially what we would call coordination through co-location. That uh, it was a very kind of California approach to thing. There was no structure, there was not a legal entity, it was just co-location, and the most important place in the whole thing is the coffee shop, where everybody sits, smokes, drinks espressos, and trades ideas. Uh, but the idea was that through this, they would develop the IT workforce, uh, that there would be a brand for the IT sector, raising awareness, and it would be some sort of an entry point to stimulate public-private dialogue. Now, I should point out, at the time, you know, we had this idea, okay, this is good, we want an IT hub, uh, but you know it's not just about the hub. It's about all these other things around it. And we had kind of a working hypothesis how something like this could lead to these other things, even if, uh, as long as this was successful. So what we did is to help crystallize the concept. So we provided quite a bit of technical support uh, particularly getting some business plans together because these came to us as very, very early stage concepts. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have worked with IT people before, but they have a new idea about every 20 minutes. And they're all used to each other having all of these crazy ideas and they don't take it so seriously all the time. Edin's particularly uh, a tornado of ideas. And what we helped do was lend credibility to the initiative so that other companies would say, okay, well, this one's the one that's going to be seen through. I should get behind this. And you know, from the perspective we have now, this was probably the most important thing that we did. Our bigger symbol of this was financial support. It was 50,000 euros, which not that much. Uh, we put more in in facilitation than we did in cash, and that went to companies who were ready to move in in order to kind of defray the risk and costs of moving from their current locations into new location, uh, which isn't such an easy thing to do uh, without investing money. And eventually, uh, along this journey, other donors came in as well. So what happened? Now, in the first two, th I point out what happens in the hub. It was full in less than a year. Uh, they're currently, sp they've spilled over into the non-hub part of this abandoned uh, apartment building and shopping center that they had taken over. Uh, 
So they've basically filled all of the parts that they can fill now. They're looking to build something uh, in another area so that they can keep growing organically. And, and this is uh, something that's also happened despite the fact that some companies have graduated out. Uh, they maintain contacts, but some people have just, uh, you know, when you have companies going from four people to 40 in 18 months, space becomes an issue. So uh, in the training, there's been about 1,000 people trained, 160 internships. That's all inside. It's all nice. Uh, but some other things outside have happened that we've picked up on that we thought we were going to have to work on directly with supplemental interventions. For example, students report greater awareness of IT as a career choice. Some of it's because their friends have done internships or got jobs, etc. But companies and professors that we've interviewed relate this to this hub and a couple of other in IT interventions that we've done. Clever use of media was a big part of that. Uh, working with a fairly sophisticated group of people like this, they know that they're going to uh, tweet things. This was profiled in Forbes. Uh, it was all over local media, Al Jazeera. I mean, Bosnia is not such a big place and they don't have a plethora of good news stories, so this was really picked up. And that meant that politicians caught on. The same people who thought that they had e-government with emails realized that this is growing. Bosnia has huge youth unemployment. I need to get elected. I should be somewhere around this. So it, it opened the door in a way that we thought maybe we would have to do ourselves previously to uh, these people in the hub to get access. And within a few months, IT was declared a strategic sector instead of just the wood and manufacturing that is typically done in the region by two different levels of government. And, you know, as a result of that, there's 15 different legislative proposals dealing with everything from education to promotion to land use related to the IT sector that are out for public commentary right now and should be up for a vote very soon. This by itself, and mostly f the direct things, uh, has increased technology employment in the country by 5% so far, uh, but we think that's the tip of the iceberg because these other parts are going to take time. You don't see uh, legislative change leave, lead to massive employment growth right away. It's a, quite a long process. And the model was replicated, but not in Bosnia. They have this, uh, it's called Hub 387 because that's the country code of Bosnia-Herzegovina. There's now a Hub 385 in Zagreb. There's this uh, this concept of Hub 38X, where they're actively shopping it around, and they've been in discussions with Belgrade, Serbia. They're in discussions with people in Ljubljana, and there's been some exchanges with other countries. So that's kind of the curious thing here that I'd like to dig a bit deeper in. Why the no, so-called no pilot? Well, the IT hub concept needs to be fairly large. Nobody wants to be in a hub with two companies. Not just neighbors. The right person was necessary. This was a fair, like, this guy's a visionary leader, uh, as so many people in the IT sector style themselves as. Uh, but there's not a whole lot of them around. Bosnia is a place with small cities. Sarajevo is 400,000 people. That's the biggest city. There's Banja Luka with 200,000. Everything else is 100,000 down. It wasn't really that realistic that we would get a lot of expansion inside Bosnia where we had hoped, or where we're supposed to be creating jobs for youth. But we knew enough about the sector that even knowing that, uh, we thought we could still do something to scale it up. And we were w willing to take a risk when that opportunity knocked with incomplete information. And in hindsight, I'd look at it like this with AAER. Actually, we would have probably phrased it as pathway to crowding in or something different at the time we were thinking about this. Uh, but now, looking at it like this, so, you know, the organic growth of Hub 387, uh, the community of IT companies has bought into it. They're expanding it. You know, the adopt and adapt 
has happened. There is quite a bit of scale there by the standards of the Bosnian IT industry. A large percentage of companies are involved in this one way or the other. But expansion wasn't that likely in a small market, few cities with enough companies, no visionary leadership, etc. The intervention was attractive to media, which really was our pathway to response. And the strong social and government response has caused these most important changes in the surrounding system. So what I would say is, yes, we have actually had quite a good success getting scale despite the limited replicability of the business model itself. And the lessons to us is that, you know, you don't need an intervention to start small. Yes, it's risky to start with something big, although big in our case isn't so massive uh, by others' standards. But for us, it was fairly big and, uh, you know, it can pay off if you have a good working hypothesis how you can get to scale. Certainly do not focus excessively on the specific partner or reproduction of the business model. That can be a real trap. Yes, you want to see that, but you don't want to be blinded to the other ways that you can get things done because you're so focused on this one company, institution, uh, or other partnership. And for us, uh, seeking scale through response, not only through expansion is important, but there's, that comes with a very, very uh, important sub-lesson, which is you really need to stay t tuned into a real range of actors in the wider market system. You know, if we looked at our uh, results chains for this originally, they didn't really talk much about what really happened, and it was to the credit of the people in the regional development agency who managed this, their observations that were st starting to pick these things up from uh, things that we had never anticipated that allowed this to happen in a meaningful way. So if you'd like any more information, we also have a case study on this, both in a summarized and uh, upcoming uh, long form done by an external consultant. Uh, we're more than happy to uh, provide that to anyone interested. Thank you. Well, Andrew, you're my one hope of staying on time. No. So what I'm going to suggest is, um, is if you don't mind, Andrew, if, if, if you can, yes, and what we might do is if people have specific questions for Andrew on that specific case study, then maybe kind of come and ask Andrew after the session, because we've only really got 10 minutes or so left of the session, um, or less than. So. Kind of what I want to do is just focus your minds on, on, on what do we want to get out of this session and, and taking advantage of, of, of you as a, as a you know, hugely interesting, informed and experienced rich group here. And what I'm going to ask you to do at the, as you walk out of the session is, is think about three particular questions. You know, whether any of these case studies have, 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 have thought about you know, what you might do differently yourself in your projects and your work or whether this makes you think about anything that BEAM should do differently in terms of its focus of its research or questions around some of these questions around hitting impact at scale, or actually whether you, you, know, you feel very strongly about whether the sector should be moving in a different direction or asking a different set of questions as well. So I really want to kind of just use the last 10 minutes um, to just uh, to see whether there are any kind of specifically dominant points that, that you feel that you want to sort of raise here that and, and, and sort of create some consensus, and this is your, op your opportunity really, you know, just to give you some feedback about some of the kind of issues that, that people raise from the tables, you know. I think someone used coined a really good phrase on a, on a, on a note, which is around, um, are we suffering from pilotitis? Is there sort of so much talk about pilots the whole time? And uh, and it's interesting. I think two of the case studies you have here are actually kind of, in in, some, in many ways, are saying actually we just went straight for scale. You know, the whole thing was actually designed around uh, a design at scale. Whereas to a certain extent, I think Colin's message is actually it took a lot of experimentation and trial and trying different things and and quite a series of nudges and different interventions. So. Is the whole concept and language around pilots and the, the venture capital approach now turning into an excuse to not do proper planning and, and not do proper analysis around impact at scale and scalability, as James was talking about at lunchtime? Um, 
Another, another issue that emerged was the question around thin markets, a constant challenge around um, uh, how do we achieve scale when we're, so many of the markets we're working in are very thin markets and, um, and getting companies to come in and replicate and copycat is, is a real challenge. Um, another issue I think that, that was really interesting that emerged that Stuart mentioned, I wonder, is um, around the political economy analysis. Most of the time in, in, in all the projects I've seen, the political economy analysis tends to be used to tell you why something isn't feasible, why you shouldn't go somewhere. And I mean, I challenge people to say, actually, could we be using political economy analysis to, to pick winners? To actually think, actually, who is you know who has got the president's backing, or actually you know who are, who are the people that are going to be able to change the the regulatory structures in a way that's going to be able to help you to uh, to hit scale. Um, so those are just some thoughts, and uh, I'll open the mic up to if people have got any kind of um, comments or questions that they want to raise to the panel that or, or they want other people to think about as um, on the, on the topic. Joe, sorry, Joe, and then I'll come back to you, James. Thanks, Sachin. Um, I think this builds a little bit on what you just said, Sachin. It also builds on what you said, Andrew, about um, can we get to scale by skipping the pilot phase? And, and it's maybe an idea for Beam. Um, and you know we're all obsessed with pilots because we like new ideas and owning new ideas. We all think we've got the best idea. But probably 20% of us in this room, maybe more, have taken a pilot to scale or near to scale. So could Beam have or create a facility or diffid create a facility that replicates in other countries market development interventions that already work. And, and I realize that there are all sorts of inhibitors to this, you know, context, political economy and stuff. But could we create a cross-border replication facility um, by someone that has a, a kind of 30,000 foot view of what's going on in the development sector, in the private development sector, um, to replicate what's already got to scale? I mean, this is also what David pointed, pointed to. Um, you know, Emshwari works in one country, works really well. There might be regulatory barriers in other countries, but can we do this in Uganda, Christopher? Can we, can we do this in Rwanda? Um, but the thing is, we're so country focused and we're so intervention focused. I don't think we can do that. It needs someone with a much um, higher aerial view. And I think, I think Beam or Diffid or someone could have that. Uh, interesting, yeah, and actually reminds me one of the um, when I was speaking to Jonathan Wong, who used to run the innovation hub at Diffid, and his his last sort of comment he left for Diffid was, I think they did some analysis of all the money that's in different challenge funds around different countries, and they thought actually, can we like do some analysis and pick some winners out of that, and then throw some even bigger amounts of money at a, at a smaller group? Right, of those exactly. And really, that's the kind of thing you're talking about. James, I'm <coughs> I'm James from Pint Foundation. Uh, my first question goes to David. Um, I like the way you described the intervention, you know, moving from pilot to, uh, you know, to scale. Or well, also, you didn't talk much about the interest rate. So my question is, what is the effect of interest rate on the overall performance of the intervention that you described? My second question goes to Collins. Um, you raised the issue of, uh, you know, the tractor as a technology, and um, this is a technology that is mostly imported you know, so the effect of exchange rates on the importation of this technology, is there any effort by the intervention to kind of try to domesticate this technology as we've seen in other agricultural equipments? Thank you. And just to broaden that out a little bit before you respond, I guess this kind of relates to one of the things we were talking about is that most of these models are focused on specific new products or new businesses or sectors. And one of the things we all felt was actually, <coughs> has there been enough discussion about the, <coughs> the supporting functions and the, and, the, and the actual enabling environment around some of these? So actually, you raised an interesting question about the, I think part of the theme of your question is actually how can projects respond to uh, uh, environmental external factors around enabling scale? So, um, David, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, the first thing, be very, very careful um, about the idea that we uh, just finance a business and that business get to scale and everything else. Um, uh, that's just not credible in many cases. So, I, of course, presented him Shwari because it's 15 minutes, so I took 20. Um, uh, college took 21. Um, uh, I timed it. Uh, so, the idea that we just pick winners and just fund them and everything is just not credible for me. Many of the constraints to get to scale are external to the firm and are complex and multifaceted, and getting to scale means tackling all of these, these different constraints in ways that coincide and coalesce, allow scale to happen. So it's multi-partner, it's multi-function, 
um, and very complex, which is the kind of case that Collins was presenting. You know, we have to get capacity building the contractors association, we have to get credit guarantees from the Bank of Nigeria. You also looked at export credit guarantees from the Indian government, looking at where the tractor supply was coming from. You had sales and service uh, agreements to be made, you had GPS tracking, and there's pilots in all of these areas, all these, all these constraints around the market system framework, which have to come in and coalesce to drive value in the core of the market. So the idea that we use, if you use all the, the funds in challenge funds, put it outside of a challenge fund, do something else with it, frankly. Um, as regards the interest rates, they're 7.5% on a fixed fee basis. So uh, Ron, who I think is in the room, uh, asked me about the API, Ron, uh, asked me about the APR of that and how offensive that is. The APR is about 90%. If you want payday loans in the UK, those are advertised on TV, and one of which was invested in by the Bank of England, uh, sorry, the uh, Church of England, in fact, a uh, moral beacon in British society. Uh, rates between 2,500 and 5,000% APR. So 90% in Kenya is a damn sight better value than 2,500% Church of England funded Wonga uh, loans in the UK. Okay, I'll, I'll start by uh, responding to your question on uh, what we are doing to domesticate technology. Right, I think when we were approached by the government, uh, they were saying they want to go towards finding a way to have uh, tractors and mech uh, agricultural me uh, mechanization, most of the equipments assembled in Nigeria. But manufacturing it, I don't think will ever happen in Nigeria very soon. And let me just remind you, Nigeria has not been traditionally an agricultural economy as such. So this is really new. And for us, even making this movement in an economy that has been heavily dependent on other bigger sectors is quite a move. So we hope that as the sector grows, then there could be opportunity for government to put in policies that encourage local manufacturing and local assembly. On going to scale all at a go, I just have maybe an example to give. M-Pesa has worked perfectly in East Africa, in Kenya. In South Africa, they have just said, Nothing. In Nigeria, mobile money, even after everybody is pushing laws being put in place, it is just growing at this pace. So I think the issue we need to think about is, does it fit the context? And context has something to do with the culture and level of trust within the space that you are talking about. So, scale and replicate, careful, I would think that we need even to try it out a bit, then we grow it. That's my thinking. Really good thoughts, really good thoughts. And yeah, it, I make sure it always reminds me, is it a rod for our back? Every time we start a new project, at some point the conversation comes up, oh, we're looking for the next Mpesa. So, um, so yeah, which, uh, and it makes it sound like it's an easy thing to do. So, um, uh, back to the floor, any other comments or questions or? Um, yeah, I'm Todd Flower. Um, so I, I haven't worked on SEC or dividend fund activities, but it just these are just two comments. One, it just sounds like the pilot to scale question seems like a value judgment more than anything else. Whether it's a whether it is a pilot or whether you're scaling just seems to be in the eye of the beholder more than anything. Um, but then the other, just it seems like in a couple of these cases, a lot of it just reminds me of something from I think it's from nutrition at one point, which is the idea of positive deviance. Um, it seems like in both. Um, for the, the IT scale and and uh, on the banking side, in both cases you had the right people at the right time and you happen to be open enough to identify those people and then invest in them. And it sounds like on the tractor side, you're trying to do that in multiple spaces with different institutions and trying to find somebody who wants to behave differently and then find a way to invest with them to reduce their risk to try that behavior in the system where they exist. Thanks. There we, there we go, Jim Woodhill working for the Global Donor Platform. Um, I've, I've got a question about success and failure. So, I mean, we know that sort of, what, 
seventy percent of small businesses fail, and we've you know we've heard some really good examples here. So I'm just wondering what the sort of story is about what degrees of failure you have to have in this whole game to get a few of the sort of winners we've we've heard, and how do you accept that, and how do you under understand that, and uh, what what does that mean for the overall programming approach? Yeah, I mean David Ferrand, uh, who's the chief executive of, of FSD Kenya. Uh, David is. Uh, been doing this a long time, uh, running M4P programs. David's view is, oh, so I can look at you, Jim. You've got a broken leg, that's why he's sitting on the floor um, at the back there, not because he's Australian. Um, <laughs> although that may be something to do with it, Jim. The, uh, David Fern would say, look, um, yeah, we, they're a trust, they're slightly more removed from donors, etc. David's argument is, we, in the first five years, we had Equity Bank, and that just was a game changer in so many different ways about getting commercial banks to go downstream, that that hid many of the failures and many of the losses that we made. Um, in phase two, M. Shwari is in there, a game changer, millions of people, etc., and that hides uh, the many other failures uh, that they've had. They learn from those failures internally, but in terms of getting the trust of funders and other people, they, they, don't, they don't want to know about the failures. So here's a failure. They spent 6.3 million pounds in the SACO sector, and a report that they got into the sector from looked at the, uh, the risk in the sector, the performance of the sector, and they looked at it fifth, well, however long it was, uh, eight years later, after spending six and a half million pounds just about in it, and said nothing materially has changed. So there's, there's a failure uh, uh, of a particular intervention in an area. So there's different things you're looking at. The overall impact of the program funds and the cost benefit return of that, but within which certain interventions will work uh, a minority, and the majority of interventions won't work quite as you thought they would do, um, which is why you have to take a portfolio approach, as any social entrepreneur would, 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 would do. You expect risk and failure. A lot of us here want to promote that failure. Um, I think you promote it internally within the team, so you can genuinely learn from it. Uh, the extent to which you promote it actively depends on the receptivity of your funders and donors to the message that you're giving them. I noticed Engineers Without Borders, Jim, produced a failures report a few years ago, which was lauded. They did it once. They haven't done it again. And I think that probably says something. I'm just thinking back to an email exchange uh, that actually we had uh, about portfolio approaches, uh, where you quoted Warren Buffett that said portfolios, yeah, yeah. Turns out I'm no Warren Buffett. Uh, and most of us aren't either, or we wouldn't be in this industry. Uh, but yeah, this uh, portfolio, you know, you should treat very similar to a financial portfolio in that risk and reward are correlated. And you need to really think about it. Of course, you're not going to quantify it in the same way you would financially. The tools just don't exist for it. But uh, absolutely thinking about the risk and the reward of the things that we're doing and going for the things that have the best balance between the two uh, is, to me, the best approach to uh, dealing with the successes and failures that we'll have. And occasionally we get lucky. Sometimes we belly flop, uh, but most of the time we're in the middle. Well, what do I say? Um, what I've learned in the time that I've spent in PropCom is that many cases where I have made the decision to cut because it looked like it had failed, actually two weeks down the road, I am then told, oh, those guys we had sent away have actually come back now and they're ready to move. So for me, I've never believed in the work I've done anywhere that when you are not the one doing it, when somebody else is the one doing it, you can call it a failure. You will reach a roadblock, but you can always shift direction. So if that has answered that question, that is fine. The second thing that I've also learned over time is that sometimes it is good to work with a network of people if you want to go to scale quickly. In most cases, we try to work with one company and then we invite others. But in other cases, you need to bring people who are actually competitors around the table and basically present a situation. We have just done that in one sector that has been very problematic to us, and that is the fertilizer sector. We called all the distributors working for all companies and just told them, there is a business idea here that works. Why aren't you people investing? And they told us something that we have never known before. 
And when we tackled that problem, right now we have over 25 different companies that are crowding in to work in the space. So go beyond the comfort of just the few that you have interacted with. Call everybody around the table and show them the business idea. That has worked for us and is making us think of an idea and getting to scale by working with a range of people who are interested in the space. But I go back to what I said elsewhere, that actually it is normally a governance issue, a value chain governance issue that tend to be the problem to creating systemic change. And if you can understand it and deal with it, it works really well. Brilliant, thank you. So uh, I'm conscious of time and we do need to wrap up. Um, is it a quick comment you could make? Hi, I'm Crystal Benson from TechnoServe, and I have two quick comments on failure. Uh, first, our friends at Engineers Without Borders actually do uh, produce a failure report every year, and they have since 2008. Uh, it is true that the first year got a ton of press coverage and then less so thereafter, but they're still doing it. Uh, and I think it's not a coincidence, actually, that they're a team full of engineers. Uh, in their line of work, you absolutely, you build a bridge, you build a building, and it fails you absolutely must figure out why. So I think for us, the question isn't just what is our appetite for failure, but what is our appetite to confront why we failed and then be as vocal as we can sharing that with everyone. Thanks very much. So, uh, thank you. Um, so I think with that, we, we really ought to wrap up. So um, I just had a couple of um, uh, asks, really, one of which is, um, You've got some placemats on your table, um, and uh, Being with Change is really keen to hear your thoughts, um, suggestions for uh, for follow up, um, and kind of feedback on the session. We'd we'd really like to get that feedback and uh, and any suggestions for Beam. Um, there's also a sign up sheet on the last table as you walk out. So if you're interested in more information on this particular topic, then please um, put your names down, and then we can then we can put that list together and sort of hopefully create a bit of a a kind of a, a group around this particular theme and, uh, and and push it further. And like I said, the the other last thing is the the three questions. If you've if you've had some burning thoughts but haven't wanted to speak up or we haven't had time, then any any thoughts that you have around you know has this made you reflect differently on your own practice or any recommendations for being either on your placemats or on the on using your post-it notes. Um, or uh, any ways that you'd like the whole sector or uh, ask to create messages around how the whole sector or donors should move differently as well. Um, but apart from that, I just want to say thank you very much and, uh, and please give it up for the, for the speakers and the time you put in for the case studies. <laughs> <laughs>